Hey family, do you feel it's time to make a shift in your life but have no idea where to start and can use some support? Well, the time has come. My Master Life class, Strategize Your Vision, is officially open and this is your opportunity to start living the life that was designed specifically with you in mind. Strategize Your Vision is for you if you are finally ready to embrace your purpose and walk in your truth to impact the world. You are willing to do the work necessary to eliminate negative core beliefs that's blocking your progress. Or maybe you are simply ready to receive the blessings that has your name on them. Strategize Your Vision will teach you step by step how to develop a strategy that touches every area of your life to ensure your purpose and vision are in alignment. Family, you no longer have to do life alone because together we're going to get you clear on your purpose, write your vision plainly, and build a strategy for making your vision a reality. So if you're ready, I'm ready. So let's do the work together. All you have to do is visit strategizeyourvision.com to enroll today. So when I think of the mind-body connection, I think, you know, simply, you know, how we interpret and interact with the world around us and with ourselves um, impacts us physically uh, and physiologically. Like, we can even go in depth or people can get on Google Scholar and look up, like, the, the correlation between stress, depression, and wound healing. You know, it, it, it goes that, oh, yes, I want you to get on that Google Scholar. It goes that deep. <laughs> um it's a it's a clear connection between um you know our perceptions and and you know our, our emotional health our mental emotional wellness and our our physical body hey family i'm dr shakina andrews and you're doing live with lakeisha on living her truth Welcome to the Living Her Truth podcast, where we have honest conversations about what it means to live a purpose-driven life. I am your host, Lakeisha Wooder from LakeishaWooder.com, the place where women receive the tools necessary to feel seen, heard, and supported while pursuing their purpose. And now every week, you'll learn those same tools through candid and transparent conversations. Hey, Shakina girl, thank you so much for saying yes to having this conversation with me today. Thank you for the invite. Absolutely. When I run across, you know, beautiful, smart black women, I got to have them on the podcast. All right. All right. <laughs> so I'm just saying. But um, I like to start off every conversation with talking about how I come to know um, the sister friend that I'm having a conversation with. And so just to let everybody know, we met at a wellness walk. Mm -hmm. right here in Houston, Texas. One of our, I say our, because I'm, I'm assuming it's your favorite nonprofit, um, Queen Life was having a monthly wellness walk. And Shakina and I met. And it's just a really good opportunity to just come together um, with other like-minded women and mm -hmm. just get some type of exercise in. We walked for about three miles and we just, you know, walk and talk and chatted and Shakina and I had a conversation and we just bonded we clicked and I was just girl I gotta have you on my living her truth show because you guys know living her truth podcast started off as a Facebook show but life happened and I got busy and wasn't able to get her on the Facebook show but hello let's put it on the podcast so we are here today so thank you Shakina once again Thank you. Yeah, we met at um, Queen Life, uh, Queen Life's mm -hmm. Wellness Walk series. It's uh, a, a short plug. It's on break right now. I think it comes back in January, I think, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. come back in January. And I think we met during like the summertime. So we was real dedicated mm -hmm. to walking because it was hot at that thing. Girl, uh, <laughs> August in Texas. Let me tell you something about that. Weather it is hot. <laughs> you got to be dedicated to your wellness, though. Yeah. And, and plus, we just love Candace. Shout yeah. out to Candace, you know, because we just we just love her. But um, but yeah, so Shakina and I, we we connected because I think you do something, you know, really, really powerful and interesting in your, you know, in your career of choice. But before we we hop into it, I want to ask you this question because it's so crazy. 
um, recently, and I've shared this before, recently I've gotten back into therapy because okay. um, a year ago I lost my brother. Suddenly my brother was killed. And so, I'm sorry, yeah, thank you. So his death just, you know, it was like a domino effect of a whole bunch yeah. of things that's, that's going on. And I yes. literally was in this really bad headspace. Understood. And, then, and then hubby and I, we had some personal stuff going on and it, it was just a lot. So I was like, let mm -hmm. me get back into the therapist chair. Mm -hmm. And so I've been going to, to therapy. And so one day, um, you know, my husband asked me, he was like, so um, how did your sessions go when you went and went to go talk to the psychiatrist? And I was like, or a psychologist. And I was just like, psychologist, no, I went to a therapist. Like, <laughs> I don't know why I got, you know, and this is, this is a judge-free zone, you guys. So Do you know why? You, now, don't make me. Now I'm about to put, put my imaginary glasses on. The glasses are all. Yeah, I'm don't like. you know why you got defensive? Come on. Fish sore. Fish sore before that's, I jump in. That's, that's why I'm, that's why we about to talk about it. Because I'm like, why am I getting so defensive? Because he said psychologist as opposed to therapist like you know why is that so i want you to break it down okay. is, there a th is there a difference between a therapist and psychologist and if so what is that what is that what is that difference and how do we know which professional to seek help with okay. if there's a difference if there's a difference so um if you want to get into like the legalese and kind of the practice-based definitions mm -hmm. um uh, you could, I don't want to kind of go there, but in some states, legally, there is a designation between who can call themselves a therapist and who may call themselves a psychologist, and that's usually training and, and licensure. Therapist is a larger umbrella term, right? A lot of people can provide therapy. A lot of people can be therapists, marriage and family therapists, um, substance abuse counselors are therapists, mm -hmm. um, people who may be uh, more so into like life coaching. The therapist. Um, psychologists also provide therapy. We've been trained in that. Um, we've also been trained in um, diagnostics and then my favorite thing, assessment. Um, so we give, we, we have the training to give a test unlike um, people who may be, you know, trained in like counselors, like master's level uh, counseling or um, unlike, and this is the other thing which people get confused, mm -hmm. what you just said, also psychiatry, those are MDs, right? they provide medications that we cannot provide. I will not be advising you on any meds. You need to go see MD. Um, <laughs> so um, so there's, legal, there's a legal designation. Uh, there's differences in training and education. But I think um, what people need to ask themselves in deciding who to see is uh, ask themselves and ask the person as you talk to them about their training and background and expertise and what types of things they're comfortable, you know, working with. Um, and also consider, um, cause I am, I ain't always had things. So I'm always very cognizant of um, pockets, uh, money. So, you know, I'm serious, really. Um, so for example, if someone had, we'll say substance, a substance use issue, if someone had a substance use issue, mm -hmm. sure, they can come see me. Um, for that issue, I'm trained, you know, trained in working with um, behavioral health issues and uh, substance use um, at a certain level being um, one of those behavioral health issues. But I, as a psychologist, um, uh, require a different reimbursement, reimbursement um, mm -hmm. versus perhaps a, a master's level counselor who might be specialty trained in substance use disorder might be a little bit more more reasonable, more affordable. Um, also depends on people's like insurance plans. So those are the types of things. Think about, think about skill, think about service, think about fit, right? Um, because you can go to the, the best trained and you know all of the ABC one, two, three behind the name. And if you don't fit with them, you ain't getting nowhere in theory. So think about you know all those yeah. things. Um, yeah when you try to select a professional. Absolutely. But I'm going to get on you just a little bit. And so this is just... <laughs> Please, because I'm like, because the word psycho, I, I know it's just, it's just, it's an underlining thing that... that... All, all it means is Greek. It's Greek. If you just, if you study word parts, all it means is the mind. That's it. That's it. Psyche, the mind, that's it. But... Um, Why do we equate that as crazy though? Because, because, because... Um, culture. You'll, um, if people work with me, 
like therapeutically. Uh, I speak a lot about like culture, socialization, and how, you know, our identity factors impact uh, the world in which we live and how we engage with that world and how, how people engage with us. Um, and so you had a poor, I'm going to go ahead and presume, it might not be accurate, but I'm just going to presume, you had a poor response to psychologist or, you know, that, that very formal um, title, um, because uh, you have been taught that only crazy people, which I hate the word crazy, but only crazy people need that level of a professional, right? Mm -hmm. You gotta be seeing things, hearing things, you know, about to kill yourself. This is what, this is, this is the popular thinking now, to, to need, or even want, that level of professional. And it's a lot. It's a lot. But we all live in a world um, in which we've been influenced in some way by, you know, certain things. So that's the, it's a lot, it's still a lot of mental health stigma, even though I think we've come very far. And when I say we, I actually mean the black community in particular, black women in particular, I'll say, um, which leaves out black men, but these are my beliefs. Um, I think we've come very far in acknowledging the positive role in mental health care and engaging with a psychologist, engaging with psychiatry if, if medications will help you and keep you more balanced and keep you functioning well. Uh, I think um, we've really developed, I would say, in my lifetime um, in that way. Mm -hmm. No, you're absolutely right. That's why I was like in the beginning, this is a this is a judge free zone. This is a safe zone for the listeners because I caught myself because when I reacted like that to my husband, I caught myself and I'm like, why am I getting all divisive? Because I believe in therapy. Therapy mm -hmm. helped me out. You know, mm -hmm. um, I've shared my story before of surviving sexual abuse. The way mm -hmm. I was able to to start to heal was going through therapy but i don't know it's it's like that psycho because like you said it's a stigma so when i hear psycho i automatically you know equate that to crazy so that just means that i still have some you know some learning to do some probably some negative mindset issues that i still need to overcome because when he said that term i i'm like i don't need medication i just need to go talk to somebody <laughs> like mm -hmm. but it's absolutely nothing wrong with that so i so you know, I recognize it in the in the moment. I was just like, you know what? I'm gonna talk to Shakina about that. Like, we're gonna break that thing down because yeah. I don't. It's just it's just stigma and what nobody. we've been told about the type of people that benefit from mental mm -hmm. health care. Uh, we have been told that um, only seriously ill, completely non-functioning, yep. about to you know eating peanut butter in the middle of the street or something. People need. Um, or can benefit from mental health care and it's it's not accurate mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely that's why we're having this this conversation today so how did you how did you get into this work because you are a phd right you have a phd right? i am girl yes mm -hmm. i am i don't act yeah. like it sometimes especially now we're back to that so come on <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't make me turn on spotify real quick don't make me no, do no, it no 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 Let's, let's, I got my bond in. Let's try to keep it professional. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, okay. So you were, um, how did oh, you get sorry, this, I think I interrupted the question. How did you get into this field of work? Okay. So, uh, uh, true story. I have always wanted to be a clinical psychologist. I wrote it in my senior book. If I had my senior book out, it's in a box in the garage. I would show really? it to you. Um, mm -hmm. um, I initially wanted to be in forensics um, until I realized what forensics was and, and at the PhD level, who I'd be working with, which is um, uh, criminals, uh, you know, people who committed serious offenses. Um, oh, okay. Knowing, knowing the person I was, I probably would, you know, go into things like serial killers and going to Quantico and things like that. No. Um, so I was like, mm, that ain't gonna work. Um, but I still want to be a clinical psychologist because mm -hmm. uh, I enjoy the, uh, I, the my, my line when anything happens, is, I just don't understand people. And that's, just, that's always been my like desire in life to better understand people, you know, their motivations, why they move the way they move, you know. Um, people it can be fascinating. Um, and learning about yourself can be fascinating. 
Um, and then as I developed and grew, um, I think uh, my passion is um, helping people learn about themselves and helping them to um, learn and grow and empower them to live a life that's um, perfect for them. Not mm -hmm. perfect, right? Because mm -hmm. we all have our definition of a, what a, a good life is, but mm -hmm. um, really empower people to live, um, live a life of their choosing. Um, and so, you know, undergrad, I'm still, you know, I, I knew I wanted to be a clinical psychologist. So undergrad majored in um, psychology, but not quite sure about specialty. I didn't know, you don't know what you don't know, right? Uh, right. Me coming from my background, um, it was it, the victory was me getting in college um, because that hadn't been done. Um, but uh, so it took me learning more about the field and how diverse it is for me to realize I needed a specialty. Like I need you know something to concentrate on because it's too big. The field of psychology is too big to just float. Um, and so I actually had a, a significant medical, medical event at the age of 18. I had an accident in which I lost the use of my um, right hand. Uh, so everything at the wrist cut. Um, had to go through PT. And that happened two weeks after I graduated high school. So... Um, and PT yeah. is physical therapy for people. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. You'll hear me. Please do that. Please, because I work in a medical population, so I'm just throwing out acronyms like people know. Um, so yeah, um, did did physical therapy. My grandma tried to bribe me to stay, <laughs> stay in my hometown. One working left. I said, "Good day." I'm not. Mm -mm. Y'all know this plan. This been my plan for 13 years. Old. I'm not staying here. Me and this one hand, we going. I'll chuck you the piece with this good hand. <laughs> Just uh, with that life experience, um, uh, got into thinking about health psychology and, you know, um, how people engage with themselves, you know, medically as a, you know, person with a chronic illness or a chronic condition, um, how people engage with health care and um, things like that. And so concentrated on health psych and um, that's been my concentration ever since. And so my PhD is in medical clinical psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, during a time in which I was getting a master's degree, because my path was not linear, right? Because uh, I was building a lot of, building building my path under me as I went. And so just learning things as I, as I go along. So I didn't go straight to um, a doctorate. I did a master's program first. And um, a mentor there, um, Dr. Stafirik, he's no longer at the school I went to. He's at another school, actually in my hometown now. Um, but um, made me aware that people actually, uh, so it's interesting, we started off this conversation with, you know, our world is built on the things we've been told. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know in psychology at that time. So this was me at 21, 22, 22, not 21, uh, just newly 22. I didn't know that uh, people in psychology study spirituality or that you can like bring in like religion and spirituality in the field of you know, therapy, I thought those two things should be different. Um, but no, so it took Dr. Stafiri telling me, you know, yeah, this is a whole, you know, budding field. And if you want to also get into that, you can get into that. And so I also, um, uh, my um, thesis, my master's thesis for the, my master's degree was um, a little bit of investigation, not a little bit, an investigation of connection between uh, um, religion, spirituality, and acceptability of mental health care like that population and their perspectives on mental health uh, help seeking and then my dissertation was a marriage of kind of both areas i created a spiritually integrated therapy intervention for women um who have been diagnosed with uh infertility of various causes um so that's a little bit about kind of how now and then you say what you doing now now i do nothing but health psych assessment um uh currently um uh so that's what i do full-time and then my my prop my practice which i started in april of 2018 i get to do what i want so i focus on a lot of different things mm -hmm. um run, runs the gamut from uh like a basic you know skills that we can all use mm -hmm. uh boundaries and boundary setting boundary maintenance 
um, communication, um, interpersonal skills, emotional aware awareness. Um, so those types of things to more trauma related work, depression, anxiety related interventions. Um, so it's diverse now, but I'm trained in health psych. Mm -hmm. I love that. You know, at the, at the walk, we connected on um, having a conversation on body image and just yes. truly being comfortable in our own skin. So why do you think that's, it, that's important? Because you did mention that you help people to get to know themselves. And I do that too, because my coaching program is based off of self-awareness, because I truly believe that you have to know who you are so you can know where you're going, right? And self-awareness helps you with that. So why mm -hmm. do you think it's important? Body image is important on our self-awareness journey, or do you even think it's important on our self-awareness journey? I do. Um, I see body image as just a, a simply a body image and then acceptance. So body image, how you, your perceptions of your like, physical self, and then the next step from that, which is an acceptance of those perceptions, right? Because you can have a body image, it can, it can be negative and you can re reject that. So um, um, healthy body image mm -hmm. and acceptance of your um your body image yeah i see that as a part of wellness and emotional well-being and health because think about it your body is the only thing you take with you everywhere mm -hmm. you can move from house to house place to place mm -hmm. you can be you can even not have a home not have a place and you're still always within yourself like you are and i know i'm speaking kind of metaphorically as if you know we are something else living in the body because it's actually what I believe. We are like a, a soul living in the body, but, um, but yeah, so it's important to have a healthy respect for, I'll say, um, your, your body image. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. And the, the reason why that um, particular part of our conversation really stood out is because I knew for me, I had a, a, negative body image for a long time because as a sexual abuse survivor you know I hit my body for a long time mm -hmm. like just layers and layers of clothes mm -hmm. because I did not want to attract uh, number one my stepfather because my stepfather is the one that who who was my abuser and then mm -hmm. I didn't want to attract any other crazy yeah. you know so for a long time I had you know uh and just didn't like, did not like my body. And I'm one of those women who developed really early, mm -hmm. you know? So I swear I went to bed one way at 11 years old and I woke up and I had a whole brand new body. That's how I felt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had a whole brand new body. And so I had to work through that because, mm -hmm. you know, my body was being attacked. Yeah. By yeah. Yeah. I think that's a powerful, and so we always go back to, okay, you can tell by the way I frame every response to a question that in terms of, uh, so we were talking about earlier, you know, therapy and how you choose what type of professional to see for therapy or counseling. And so I was saying, just ask questions about their expertise and things like that. Also, um, depending on what you think might help you, um, ask about that theoretical orientation if mine is CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy which is I see a whole lot of connection between how we perceive things and um, what we've been, how we've been taught to perceive things um, and our responses. And so that's the foundation I want to set for my reply to, you know, you know, you sharing that you had a negative body image based on your experience of sexual abuse. And, it's because, and, it, and it had nothing to do with your actual body. Even if you would have got, you know, even if at eight, nine, ten years old, you would have been just like, boom here and then boom here. If no one had responded negatively to that, if no one had, you know, suggested through their actions that, you know, oh, because of this, then I can treat you that way, you would not have, that would not be a thing. That would never have been a connection that you would have drawn. But because, again, I, I very much incorporate a lot of, um, acknowledgement of cultural identity and you know things like that because you are a woman a black woman mm -hmm. uh, living in a stereotypical black woman's body right because not all black women live in stereotypical black you know women's bodies um then this 
then the cultural system and you know in which we currently live hopefully it's changing um says you know oh you know i can treat this person this way because of what the body signals which is it which is false which is erroneous right um but we all have that same we all learn that same lesson and so even though that's false and we know that's false knowing that okay if, if this is a rule of the world if i show my you know body body that men want men or women you know that people want then that means i must be mm-hmm. setting myself up for so don't let me hide mm-hmm. um yeah it's all it's all unfortunate socialization and learning um but i'm glad that through you know, therapeutic work through your challenging of these, you know, things um, that you realize it has nothing to do with your body mm-hmm. um, and more to do with the uh, the vileness of, of the people that decide to violate other people. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And this is another reason why this conversation is, is so important because I developed that mindset as a kid. As a kid, I didn't know that, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know? So as an, as an adult and I'm not, I can't even really say as an adult, going through therapy is what really helped me to really un- understand that and unlearn that way of thinking. Mm-hmm. So that's another reason why I think a lot of us should seek help because there's a lot of, you know, negative core beliefs that's developed off of negative experiences that are completely incorrect because sexual mm-hmm. abuse, you know, abusers is all about control. Mm-hmm. Like you said, I could have been flat board, flat chested or whatever. Yep. I still would have did it because it's all about yes. control. It's not about and my that's body. it. Yeah. You know, but until we unpack those things, you know, those negative core beliefs are being, you know, built on the inside and it's literally dictating our decisions and our actions and how we treat people, how we look at ourselves. Right. right? So so yeah, so I, I'm just thankful that somebody took the time to even pay for my therapy because my therapy session started off because somebody paid for them. That's so nice. I'm thinking, yeah. yeah, so I'm I'm lucky in in that regard. So help us to understand that mind body connection, so we can use it to pursue our purpose because that right there for a long time, you know, stopped me from really embracing what my purpose is because my purpose is to share my testimony of surviving sexual abuse right so women can see that there's life on the other side that you can really survive this and oh, yeah. live happy healthy healthy you know lives and have relationships but you know even after realizing and understanding you know um and working through the issues of my negative body issue i still denounce my purpose i still Hmm. ran from it for a long time so help us to really understand that connection so other women out there can really pursue their purpose relentlessly so when you say mind body connection i just think of the um the innate relation internal relationship between um our perceptions you know this 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 computer here that tries to make sense of everything going on within and around us um and our our physical responses to it, and I think it's it's no, it's no more just plain and evident um, example of the mind body connection, or how our um, our thoughts really impact how we feel and how the body responds than uh, like bubble guts. You know what I mean, by bubble guts. So some big is coming up, <laughs> or like you got something to do, and then all of a sudden, oh, I got that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, or, you know, when, you know, something, you know, surprising happens and, oh, we get a little flutter. Oh, kind of our, our heart stops. Um, that is not, you know, fully internal. It is because we are responding to the events of life around us or, you know, responding to something around us. And then our body is, you know, responding based on that. Um, so when I think of the mind-body connection, I think, you know, simply, you know, how we interpret and interact with the world around us and with ourselves um, impacts us physically uh, and physiologically, like we can even go in depth so people can get on Google Scholar and look up like the the correlation between stress, depression, and wound healing, 
you know, it, it, it goes that, oh yes, I want you to get on that Google Scholar. It goes that deep. <laughs> um, it's a it's a clear connection between um you know our perceptions and and you know our, our emotional health our mental emotional wellness and our our physical body um and so uh being uh respectful of acknowledging that mind body connection is not only acknowledging that right okay it's a fact but people can say all day okay that seems like a fact and not really act on it um <laughs> So the second part of that is um, uh, thinking about how you would like to engage in that connection, um, realizing that you cannot, uh, that you need to, you need to care for kind of both sides of it. Um, you know, uh, when I think of the care for both sides, I think of like um, <laughs> what I'm doing right now, which is burning the candle at both ends. <laughs> And how eventually that wears on, you know, the body that wears on your fatigue. Uh, and so then you need to, no, no matter how mentally sharp, you know, you may be, you know, you need to care for yourself, you know, physically and vice, you know, vice versa. No matter how strong physically, you know, you may be, you need to care for yourself, like mentally and emotionally. And so I think about the connection between those two things. And so uh, to make the connection between mind body health mind body wellness and purpose what purpose can you live on what you gonna do if your whole body or your mind break down you can't you can't live out no purpose if you don't <laughs> if you don't um don't care for yourself um in in those ways and so yeah honoring that connection not just being aware of it we're aware of a lot of things that we might not necessarily honor or you know, engage with, take care of. Um, but uh, honoring that connection really helps you pursue the things that you want. You, you know, this whole, I don't know whether it's still a thing now or it was a thing a few years back. Sorry, some of mine. Um, but this whole like team no sleep, I don't get tired. Think, who, who are you? Who is that? Who do that? Uh, I get tired. Uh, I need sleep. Um, <laughs> um, and so, you know, in pursuing your purpose or what you think is, you know, your plan, what you think will benefit other people, never forget you ever. Um, some people may call that, you know, oh, that's selfish. That's a lie. Um, everything we know about common wisdom and helping other people tells us we need to take care of ourselves first before we we can even imagine um, engaging with and helping another person. On an airline, when you take a flight, they say, if something happens to this cabin and these little things with a little cup come down, they don't say it like that because they know the words, but <laughs> <laughs> these, these little things with a little cup come down, what you're going to want to do is make sure you can breathe before you call yourself trying to help everybody else on the plane. Um, there are ethics, even in, you know, people um, with helping professions, you know, people in helping professions like mine, um, like social work, like medicine, like nursing, maybe teaching. I, I know a little bit less about teaching ethics, but there are ethics that say we need to make sure we are well. And if we ain't, we got to we gotta judge that carefully. Um, and, and if you see your colleague who ain't, you got to pull them to the side and tell them I need you to get a little bit well. Because, um, you know, you can't live out your purpose without you, you know, without you being um, healthy in the fullest way possible. Um, so I don't know if that, that went on a tangent or if that was, was, do you think that was what you were looking for? Yes. Okay. Yes. You definitely answered the question. And all I heard was a holistic approach to life, right? Because you talked about emotional uh, well-being, mental well-being, and, and that being the connection to our body. So we can do, you know, just be well enough to even pursue our purpose. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, having a holistic approach to life, meaning that making sure that I am, I have harmony in all areas of my life is how mm -hmm. I was able to live just happily overall. Right. Mm -hmm. And really truly embrace what my purpose is. And in my course, strategize your vision, I teach you how to build a strategy to manifest your vision 
that encompasses all areas of your life, right? And so for those who are listening, shameless plug, strategizeyourvision.com for more information. So, and I just teach a lot of the um, tactics that helped me out, right? And so with that being said, wellness, not just physical wellness, but mental wellness is a part of the class as well. And, and I know wellness is a big thing in your practice because you talk about it a, a lot heavenly on your website. So talk to us about wellness. How do you define wellness and how do we recognize if our mental wellness is off? Okay. Um, so wellness in general, and I also speak to this on my website, like you said, because I am so used to working in health populations, I think people conflate health and wellness, like the definition of both. Mm -hmm. uh, I see them as distinct, right? When people think about health, they think about the absence of a disease. You know, I ain't sick. I got all my faculties. I'm healthy. Okay, fine. Um, but wellness might not be that, that um, dichotomous. So like not that, you know, couldn't. I also think about wellness as more of a process or a journey than a destination, right? We're, we're all working on some facet of wellness. So, and that also encompasses my next thing, which is, you know, that it's multifaceted. It's not just stamp. All right, I'm, I'm all right. I'm well. Um, it, um, one can be, you know, emotionally well. One can be um, occupationally well um mentally like cognitively well so have all their facets and you know cognitive um abilities one can be interpersonally well or not you know interpersonally well you know interpersonally socially feel like they have um healthy relationships of good quality i'm not talking about quantity right because quality is important you said quality y'all quality over quantity <laughs> But also, but also, she an introvert, y'all, so she don't want to be around a lot of y'all no way, so keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, did I say occupationally? Like, occupationally, you know, well, just sometimes you have, a, you know, good, you know, things going on here, but just really stressed out and burnt out on your job. And just not. Um, so I think you said, um, did you say the word balance? Harmony. Harmony. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think how I conceptualize like multifaceted, you know, wellness. I used to speak a lot about, you know, work life balance, you know, because a lot of my, and it had to be like, it was this way because it had to be. A lot of my concentration was on finish this degree for years. And so um, it was very unbalanced, like, because you know, a PhD. Um, at, at, it was it was still very unbalanced if I'm gonna be honest with myself at the master's level because I was funding that myself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I'll kick it and I'll engage with these things, but I don't have the you know the time. Time is you know finite, so it was very unbalanced in there. You know, PhD can be very unbalanced, and and you rely on people kind of in your personal life to be gracious about that lack of balance because it's just that's just the nature of the beast and so you know um i finally got done with that whole process when i was 30 and i have been in school since i was four years old next to my preschool every year of my life so I was four so um very like very unbalanced and so i was in terms of like wellness used to be very concentrated on like balance you know in a very like rudimentary check mark fashion like check i went out okay maybe that's social awareness or you know check you know i you know did something at work um but i like the word harmony mm -hmm. um and i think i like the word harmony because it speaks to now how i look at um wellness which is more about which is more values based right because some facets of life will be more important to us than others depending I'm on the girl mm -hmm. yeah I'm a career girl. I accept this about myself. Other people don't, and that's, uh, and, you know, and that's fine. But um, but I am, and so my a lot of my wellness, not the majority, but a significant portion of the pie. I'm thinking like a pie chart. A significant portion of it is attached to how satisfied I feel in my in my occupational purpose, 
you know, and, and kind of just that level of wellness for me. Um, I'm less of a, like, um, an interpersonal, you know, person. I have, I have my folks that I love and I, you know, my solid folks that I know I can rely on and I'm good. You know, I am good. I'm, I'm not one to, I don't need to be kicking it every weekend, you know, hey, how you doing? What you doing? I did it in my 20s. I, you know, we referenced back that ass up earlier. Look, I got bad knees to this day. I had my fun. I'm over. I <laughs> <laughs> got bad knees to this day. I you love know how girl knees. This, this cold woman knees. Cold woman knees is what I got now. I did my thing. <laughs> um, um, but, um, and so I like I like the word harmony and, and I like it because it speaks to, you know, these facets of wellness. Are they working together in the way you want them to? Not the way I be want them to. Not people that be like, uh, you still single. <laughs> you, you know, not I need other some, people I need some clues bombs. I need some clues bombs, side effects. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> ah, okay. London on the track. Um like not not you know in the way people say oh especially again i bring a lot of, of identity related things into the work that i do not in the, in the way that people say we should have it all right we should have the fulfilling career have the husband or long-term relationship or you know partner i don't want to leave out people who um, have other sexual identities have the partner have the you know children have the big old house, you know, and that's, you know, that's satisfaction. That's having it all. No, that if that's not your ideal balance, if that's not what you want, um, then that's not what you want. You got to find your, your own idea of what is wellness, what is harmony, you know, for you. And once you figure that out, then engaging in, like you said, you know, um, plans, engaging in actions that speak intentionally to what wellness is for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that. And I love how you stress the fact that we need to define it for define it for ourselves. But I think that we don't because of unresolved trauma. You tell me, mm. you're the professional, mm. right? Mm. We are, because, and because we have this unresolved trauma, you know, we're still fighting for acceptance, validation and love mm. outside of ourselves. So we're not able to you know, define it for ourselves because we want to live up to somebody else's expectations because mm. we're be fighting for that love and validation from someone else. Mm. Think about that. I can see the role, um, you know, when you break it down like that, I can see the role of an ex a traumatic experience. And interpersonal, because there's different types of trauma, right? Mm -hmm. But we're talking about interpersonal trauma here. Mm -hmm. um, not like event-based trauma, like if someone was in a serious accident or something like that. Right. Um, we're talking about interpersonal trauma, in particular, maybe some developmental kind of interpersonal trauma and how that might impact one's uh, formation of the self and kind of a core self-identity and a confidence in that. And, you know, you know, and ability to say, you know, look, I accept myself for who I am. This is what I want in my life. What you think about it is all right, but it ain't gonna move me, you know, in any way. And so, yes, I can definitely see a connection between how the experience of a developmental trauma interrupts that development. Um, and I definitely don't want to say, because I don't like, uh, you know, as a therapist, it grieves me when people come in and express because of a trauma, feeling like broken as in unfixable. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I don't, um, I can, you know, I understand that, but um I think it really takes away a lot of the resilience people have, um, not realizing that people can uh, can still build a life um, and you know build an identity and give themselves those things that were not given to them or were taken from them. Um, so so yeah, um, I definitely see the connection there between the two, but I also see um, how people can kind of regain that sense for themselves gain or regain that sense for themselves mm -hmm. I like how you bring up broken um yeah I agree people shouldn't use that word because I think when we use the word broken it's so finite it means unfixable most mm -hmm. times 
uh, when how we people use that. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's kind of like playing towards the psyche too. Cause if you say that you're broken, you're broken, then are you, are you thinking that you're unfixable? Mm -hmm. that you cannot have that life that you really want and desire Mm -hmm. also so yeah you know there are three different words that I talk about in my book um three different words that we shouldn't use in our vocabulary right because you know when we use these particular words it subconsciously in my opinion subconsciously you know prevents us from moving outside of our comfort zone Mm -hmm. broken is a good one maybe I'll write another book and put broken in it okay (laughs) Yeah, um, how people tend to use the word. And um, I'm a very, I'm a words person, like I love words. I took a whole class called etymology, which is kind of a hmm. structural words and how we put them together. So um, broken, the denotation, the dictionary definition is just, you know, something was in the previous state, something happened to it. it really, it doesn't mean like I could um, break you know, something now. I could break my phone, you know, my screen on my phone. I can get a fix. Um, but that's not how people tend to think about people and themselves. Once they they think about, you know, some experience has damaged, you know, me. Um, and I am damaged now, you know, from that. And people will know that I am, you know, damaged from that. And people don't um, like damaged goods. <sighs> yeah. And what is a damaged good? What does that mean? What does that mean? Absolutely. What does that mean? What does that mean? Because I even had to fight over, I had to fight that too. um, Because way back when, before I got married, I dated a guy. This was the only guy that I dated. I had a child. And because he had a child, when I found out he had a child, you know, I was just like, ooh. Uh, well, let me tell you about what happened to me. Not to say that I would do anything to that child, but I just, I don't know. I just felt the need that he needed to know Mm. what he was getting into. You know what I'm saying? And maybe, maybe, you know, deep down in there, maybe I thought that I was damaged in some type of way, Mm. you know? So yeah, girl, we could talk about that all day long. (laughs) I really appreciated our conversation today. Thank you. I did too. I really appreciated it. So before I let you go, can you give us one book or audible recommendation that you've read or listened to? Because I'm a huge audible fan. God. That has changed your life in some type of way. Changed my that's heavy. That's, a, that's a big old... <laughs> or impacted in a positive way. <laughs> changed my life. Okay. I can't say change my life, but I will tell you one book that I find myself therapeutically recommending a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of like, uh, since we're talking about like early experiences and how they impact people and can shape one's uh, self image and body image being a, like a part of that, but, um, less directly related in this book. Anyway, so I, I found myself more than once, um, uh, therapeutically recommending a book called Mothers Who Can't Love. Oh, I haven't heard of that one. Mm-hmm. Mothers who can't love, mm-hmm. um, and it just um, provides examples of different types of. Um, so, um, for people who have complex relation, complex maternal relationships, sometimes it can be difficult to. So, you remember I told you earlier. I, I am really enjoying kind of in this part of my practice, in, you know, my private practice. Um, helping people with and working with them surrounding like boundaries boundary setting you know and that is difficult for people with parents especially their their mother mm. despite the fact that you know sometimes these people need a good old firm boundary and so um i've more than once kind of recommended that to give a perspective of you know not our stereotypical view of mothers is you know oh loving and devoted and all this and that's not the truth because we're all human you know we're all people um and some time people really struggle with mothering and impact their children in ways that are very negative and so this book um i've got a lot of feedback there people that this book really helps people um with not feeling so alone and feeling that right because that type of relationship with the mother is you can't say that out loud 
because then people look at you strange you know how dare you not you know um but this book um i've gotten feedback it really helps people not feel so alone like really, really helps them understand that this is a I don't know if it's common, right? Because I'm thinking common statistically. I don't know if it's common, but it's not not that rare. People making a book about it. Um, and um, gives like practical strategies for people to manage certain types of kind of personality types of mothers. Mm, mm, that's good. I'm going to have to check that book out. You know, that puts me in, that, that makes me remember this video that I saw on Instagram. Someone shared it with me and somebody was, I, I don't remember the expert's name, but she was just talking about um, how slavery, how mm. mothers, you know, talked about their children during the slavery days has affected us right now today because she said she talked about how you know uh, a mom you know caucasian mother right can talk about their child in this positive way because the child is really smart you know athletic you know athletic or whatever the caucasian mom would talk about their their child in this positive way whereas you know the African-American mom, even though she knows that her child is smart, very athletic, and probably even smarter, more athletic than that Caucasian mom's son, right? She will probably say something, just downplay it a little bit, like, oh, yeah, but, yeah, he's smart, but, yeah, he's really good at basketball, but he can do better than in this area, right? And so she took it all the way back to slavery times, when the slave master would come to that that slave and be like oh so i see your boy you know he's healthy and strong and growing up and the mom is like no he's not he's not that mm-hmm. healthy he's not that strong in a way to you know um protect her child from getting taken away or whatever but in the mind of the child who's listening to their mom mm-hmm. say this it's not seeing it from that perspective nobody is you know talking to that child about why they talk that particular way so now that child is starting to think they're less than i'm not good enough you know or i just need to work a little harder or whatever the case may be so yeah that when you talked about that book it put me in the mindset of of that video i'm gonna have to share that mm. video with you because it was it was it was a deep video it was a deep mm. video so um you also mentioned earlier that you are a wordsmith, so I have a... I don't know wordsmith, but keep, continue. I like words. I'm a nerd. <laughs> well, you like words. I'm a nerd. Continue. <laughs> so I have a, a two-word combination. I want you to tell me what your third word would be within this combination, right? Okay. The, word, the combination is self-awareness, purpose, and what third word would you add to that group? Resilience. This is why. Um self-awareness mm-hmm. as i'm thinking like a developmental process when you say this okay so self-awareness okay you start off with learning more about yourself and learning kind of what what makes you tick how you respond to things why you respond to things the way you do okay uh boom you have that awareness and with that awareness you can engage in the things of life you can kind of engage in what according to kind of your own insights and intuition you think is your purpose what you're actually supposed to be doing what will bring you fulfillment what will assist maybe someone else um in their journey right Mm -hmm. i add resilience because life happens you won't be able to escape the happenings of life we talked about some of them little happenings of life before i got on this thing Uh, (laughs) 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 you won't be able to escape you know the happenings of life and so I think building resilience the skill of resilience right is important for folks so that when those happenings happen it will knock them off their square um it won't make them question all the things that they learned about themselves during step one or whether or not they were supposed to be doing all the things in step two purpose but if you have a little resilience and learn how to um I don't know if I want to say recover Okay, I'll say recover. I'm now I'm thinking about the word. Um, so maybe take a little dip, learn how to come back, or even boom, learn how to flourish 
learn a little something from that event that you wouldn't have had without that event. Mm -hmm. um, maybe grow a little more. Um, so yeah, I think about, I don't know why, but I'm thinking about that as a, you know, a trajectory. Yeah. So self-awareness, purpose, and then, you know, resilience. Mm -hmm. you have that skill of life that assists you with continuing to live in your purpose, even when life happens. Mm -hmm. That message was for me because this has been. Was it, what, was it for, for you? It was for me. I see you. I see my me. PayPal for my ties. <laughs> This has been, ooh, it has been a challenging week, but I am here because I am resilient and I know what my purpose is and I need to keep moving forward. Shakina, thank you so much for having this conversation with me today. I really appreciate you, girlfriend. Thank you. It was fun. <laughs>